Good afternoon, students. Today is Monday, 2 May, 2022. This will be the final lecture of the semester. Our exam will be on the 10th of May, which is eight days from today. The exam will begin on Canvas at 8 o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> and it will end at 9.20. So you have 80 minutes to complete it. Please get it on your calendar now so you don't forget it. And I will send you an email the day before to remind you. If you have any questions about the course material between now and the exam, you may email me. That's always been the case. I told you on the first day of class that we would use email instead of office hours this semester, so please make use of it. The exam covers three items. If you look at the reading list, you'll see what they are. The three items are the case of Atkins versus Virginia, the Supreme Court case. We spent three days on it. Then <clears throat> we moved on to the essay by Gerald Dworkin, and we spent three days on that. And we're about to complete our discussion of Douglas Huzak on drug decriminalization. And this will be our third day on that. So a total of nine lectures. All of them are now posted on Canvas, or will be as of this evening. And you should make sure you study all of them carefully and be prepared to answer questions about them. One more thing. Um, nobody's been coming to class this semester. I've been there every day, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8, 8 o'clock in the morning. And when nobody shows up, I've been reading. Um, there will be no class tomorrow. So I won't, I won't be in the classroom tomorrow if you had thought about coming. So this will be the last time you see me or hear from me other than email. Okay, so don't go to, don't go to the classroom tomorrow. Uh, I won't be there. The, the door will simply be locked. Okay, before we get started, I tracked down the Texas law on marijuana. And this appears to be the current state of the law. Texas does not prohibit and punish the use of marijuana. Remember, Huzak's main focus in this essay is the use of drugs like marijuana. What Texas prohibits and punishes is possession of marijuana. So here's what it says, except as authorized by this chapter, a person commits an offense or a crime if the person knowingly or intentionally possesses a usable quantity of marijuana. A usable quantity. Now keep in mind that those words knowingly or intentionally, those two words, are very important. The prosecutor must prove that the person in question, the defendant, knew that the drugs were in his or her possession. If someone slipped them in to your luggage without you knowing it, you could raise that as a defense uh, to the charge. The same for the words intentionally. Okay, so it's always a defense to a charge uh, of possession of marijuana that you didn't know you had it in your possession or you did not intend to have it in your possession. Now, <clears throat> I, I said a moment ago that possession of marijuana is a criminal offense. Texas calls them offenses. The punishment depends on how much marijuana you have in your possession. So let me run through the possibilities. If you have two ounces or less of usable marijuana in your possession, you are subject to up to $2,000 fine and or 100 days in 180 days in jail. And or, so you could get both. $2,000 fine, 180 days in jail. If you have between two ounces and four ounces of marijuana, you could get up to one year in jail and a fine of $4,000. If you have between four ounces and five pounds of marijuana, usable marijuana in your possession, you could be fined up to $10,000 
and serve a term of imprisonment or jail between 180 days and two years. If you have between five pounds and 50 pounds of marijuana, you could be fined up to $10,000 and get between two and 10 years in jail. If you have between 50 pounds and 2,000 pounds, which is a ton of marijuana in your possession, you could get a you could get fined of in you could get fined up to ten thousand dollars and between two and twenty years in jail. And finally, if you have more than two thousand pounds of usable marijuana in your possession, you can be fined up to fifty thousand dollars and receive between five and ninety nine years in prison. Imagine that, if you have more than a ton of marijuana in your possession, in a, in a van, let's say, in which you are driving, you could receive up to 99 years in jail. Pretty stiff punishment, okay? Now, Huzak, I'm sure, would say that mere possession of marijuana should not be a crime because we know he argues that use of marijuana should not be a crime. Uh, perhaps he would argue that possessing a huge quantity of mar marijuana may be punished. He doesn't talk about that in this article. His focus is on the use. Anyway, I thought you'd be interested in the current law in Texas. Okay, let's get to the topic. Uh, it probably won't take the full period today. If you're following along my, on my lecture notes, I'm on page five. And we have only one section yet to cover. The section is entitled Predictions, colon, A Bad Reason to Criminalize. So let's look at this argument. It's the only argument against decriminalization that Huzak discusses. Obviously, there are other arguments, but and he discusses other arguments in other works of his. But in this particular article, he discusses just this one argument. The argument is this, and I'm quoting now from page 25. The use of drugs would soar if we stopped punishing persons who use them, unquote. So let's stop for a moment. The argument is pretty simple. Some people look at the law as it currently stands, which punishes the use or possession of drugs, such as marijuana, and they say we shouldn't decriminalize the use or possession of those drugs because if we do the use will soar it will increase dramatically now the word soar is vague it means certainly it means increase as opposed to stay the same or decrease okay so the argument is the use of these drugs will increase and the word soar also implies that it will increase a lot. It will go way up. It won't go up just a little or a moderate amount. It will go way up. It will soar to the heavens. And the assumption is that that's a bad thing. Therefore, we shouldn't decriminalize the use of these drugs. If we do, a bad thing will happen. Now, I hope by now you recognize this as a slippery slope argument. And here's how I reconstruct it. If you look in my notes on page five, you'll see an indented argument. The first premise of the argument goes something like this. If we, as a society, if we collectively decriminalize drug use, then drug use will soar. Notice that's a prediction. It, the first premise of this argument is a prediction of what will happen if we do a certain thing. The second premise is that, drug use, the, that if drug use soars, that will be a bad thing, maybe a very bad thing. So here's how I put it. We, as a society, shouldn't do anything that will cause drug use to soar, presumably because that would be bad may be very bad. The conclusion from these two premises is that we, as a society, 
shouldn't decriminalize drug use. So it's a standard slippery slope argument, and we've talked about that earlier in the course at least once, so I'm not going to repeat myself. The argument is that if we do a particular thing, a very bad thing will happen. We don't want that very bad thing to happen, therefore we shouldn't do that thing. Okay, so that's the argument. Now, I think Huzak assumes the truth of the first premise of the argument, for the sake of argument. The second premise says we shouldn't do anything that will cause drug use to soar, because that would be bad. Now, I don't know whether Huzak agrees with that. Does Huzak agree? Would, would Huzak agree with the claim that it's a bad thing if drug use increases dramatically, if it soars? I don't know. He might say, no, if drug use increases, that's okay with me. Remember, he believes individuals have a right to do as they please with their bodies and their minds. And as long as they're not harming anyone else or imposing a grave risk of harm on others, they should be allowed to do that. So if Huzak isn't troubled by one person using drugs, why would he be concerned if lots of people use drugs, even if most people use them? You think he would, he would think he would say the same thing. It's their own business. So I think Huzak's objection to this argument would come down to the first premise. Huzak thinks the prediction is unjustified. He thinks that there's no good reason to believe that if we decriminalize the use of drugs, their use will soar. Here's what he says, page 25. We simply do not have any good basis to predict how the amount of harm caused by drugs would change if we did not punish those who use them. So notice, Huzak is not saying, listen carefully now, Huzak is not saying that we have good reason to believe that drug use won't soar if we decriminalize them. What he's saying is we don't have good reason either way. We don't have good reason to believe that drug use will soar, nor do we have good reason to believe that drug use won't soar. We just don't have any good evidence either way. But notice, the first premise comes out and makes a bold claim. The first premise says, if we decriminalize drug use, the use will soar. Huzak says, what's your evidence for that? We need solid evidence to support that. And he thinks there is no such evidence. Therefore, the first premise of this argument is unsupported. It may well be true. Huzak doesn't say that it's false. He says that it hasn't been adequately supported. We don't have enough evidence to know that it's true. And that, excuse me, that undermines the argument. The person making this argument must come forward with evidence to support the first premise. Okay, let's talk about some other aspects of this. What sorts of evidence might there be to support this prediction that drug use will soar if we decriminalize their uh, drug use? Let's, talk, let's take a look at affordability. Some people think that if we decriminalize drug use, drugs will be cheaper. The black market keeps the prices high. If we make it legal to use drugs, the price will fall. And if the price falls, the use will go up. It seems to be a basic law of economics that the amount of, of, of a product consumed depends on its price. Other things being equal, the higher the price for some commodity, the less it will be, the less the demand for it, and hence the use of it. The lower the price for a commodity, the greater the demand for it. Now you see this in operation all over the place. As the price of gasoline rises, its demand for it decreases. Right? You may have cut back on your use of gasoline since the price went up. Maybe 
you used to take a Sunday drive to look at houses or the countryside. Maybe now that the price has risen, you decide against that. You say, no, I'll find something else to do with my time that doesn't involve driving my car. So people make decisions about what to consume and how much of it to consume based upon its price. So isn't it reasonable to assume that if we decriminalize drug use, the price will fall and the use or demand for those drugs will therefore rise? And doesn't that support the first premise of this argument? Well, Huzak is not convinced. He says that the price of drugs will not necessarily rise. Well, why not? Here's the first thing he says, page 25. Even were sale decriminalized, illicit drugs would become subject to taxation. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Kuzak is looking ahead. He's saying, what if drugs, a particular drug like marijuana, is no longer illegal to use? Well, the sale of marijuana presumably would then be legal, as would the purchase and the possession and the use. Companies would come into existence to provide that drug for sale. In fact, that's what happened in states like Colorado, Washington, California, Oregon. States that have decriminalized marijuana have found that companies have come into existence to sell it. Now, the state usually taxes items that are sold. As you know, there's a sales tax people pay when they purchase something. So, once marijuana is decriminalized, states like Oregon and Colorado and Washington and California will impose a sales tax, or rather, it will become subject to the pre-existing sales tax. And that will have the effect of raising the price. The states might also add on what's called a sin tax. As you know, there's a, there's a special tax imposed on cigarettes. Well, and, and the argument for that is that cigarette smoking is bad for people. It's, it's a sin, so to speak, in the legal sense. And so people who smoke should be made to pay an extra amount in tax. Uh, and maybe that money will go to providing services for people who, who get sick from smoking or who go in for treatment. So arguably, if marijuana use is decriminalized, the states that allow it will impose various taxes on it, and that will have the effect of raising the price. Do you know how much the uh, sales tax is on cigarettes or gasoline for that matter? The amount that you pay for a gallon of gasoline includes a particular amount for tax. And it's a significant chunk of what you pay per gallon. The same is true for a pack of cigarettes. The tax, the amount of the, the, the amount that you pay for a pack of cigarettes includes a significant amount that goes to the government in the form of taxes. So Huzak is predicting that if we as a society decriminalize the use of a particular drug, uh, while the price may initially drop, it will come back up once the taxes kick in. And it may come up to the same level, maybe even higher than where it was in the black market. So that would tend to keep the price high and therefore the, the amount of demand or use low. Also, Huzak, remember he's a lawyer, Huzak says that if the use of drugs like marijuana are, is decriminalized, there will, be, there will have to be in place some kind of compensation system for people who claim that they purchased um, adulterated marijuana. They will sue the seller or the manufacturer, and some of those people who sue will recover damages. The producers of the 
marijuana, because they occasionally have to pay damages as a result of a lawsuit, will raise the price to cover the increased losses that they suffer through the tort system, the compensation system. So this, that's another reason to think that the price of drugs will stay high even if they have been decriminalized. Here's what Huzak says about that on page 26. Quote, as a result of these two factors, taxation and compensation, we have almost no basis for estimating how the monetary price of decriminalized drugs would differ from the price in today's black market, unquote. Now, some states in recent years have decriminalized marijuana. So we can look to those states to see what happened. What happened to, a, to the price of what I'll call a dime bag of marijuana, which is a quantity, a certain quantity of marijuana. I, I think it was called a dime bag back in the day because it cost $10. It was a baggie with a certain amount, maybe an ounce, I don't know, of marijuana. It cost $10. So um, what happened to the price of, a, of an ounce of marijuana once states like Colorado decriminalized it? We can actually go look. Now, I don't know offhand what happened, but the price either stayed the same or it decreased or it increased. And we now have data that we can look to, and what we see happening would affect this argument. Did the decriminalization of marijuana use actually make the price go down and therefore the consumption go up? We can now look at that and study it empirically. And I, I simply don't know what the answer is. That's an empirical question. Um, I suppose I could do some research, but you can do the same to find out what happened to the price of an ounce of marijuana. Remember, though, that only marijuana has been decriminalized in these states. Drugs like heroin, LSD, methamphetamine, and so on, they remain illegal. They remain criminalized. And so this argument still applies to those drugs. We don't know what would happen to the use of those drugs if they were decriminalized. So the point that Huzak is making still applies to drugs other than marijuana. All right, let's talk now about a different aspect of this, fear of arrest. Some of the people who make this argument based on the prediction of soaring drug use, some of them think that the causal mechanism works like this. Many people today, they say, this isn't me talking or who's act. This is someone who makes the argument, the slippery slope argument. They say that whether people use a particular drug depends on whether they fear punishment for doing so. So they argue that if we decriminalize drugs, people's fear of being punished will disappear and drug use will therefore soar. So this is the causal mechanism that proponents of the slippery slope argument make. And it's, it's based on fear of arrest and punishment. So here's the question. It's a factual question. Will decriminalization of these drugs increase use because people no longer fear arrest, prosecution, conviction, and punishment? It's plausible, isn't it? It's plausible to think that some percentage of people who are currently not using drugs. In fact, let's take Texas. In Texas, I just told you today, it's illegal to possess marijuana. Now, some percentage of people who are not currently 
possessing and using marijuana would presumably possess and use it if it were decriminalized. I don't know what that percentage is, but it stands to reason that there are people who would like to use marijuana, but they choose not to because they are afraid of being apprehended, tried, convicted, and punished. Now, some people possess and use marijuana even though it's illegal and punishable. Other people don't use marijuana and they wouldn't use it even if it were decriminalized. So there are really three classes of people, logically speaking. Now listen carefully. The first class of people are people who have no desire to use marijuana, even if it's legal to do so. They don't care about it. They don't want to use it. The second class of people over here, whoops, I shouldn't hold that finger up, should I? The second class of people, I'll knock these two down. The second class of people would be those who are going to use marijuana no matter what. Whether it's legal or illegal, no matter how much is punished, they're going to use it. They like it. They are willing to risk apprehension, trial, conviction, and punishment. Okay? The third class of people are people who are deterrable. These are people who might want, who want to use marijuana, but only if it's legal. If it's illegal, they will not use it because they're afraid of punishment. If it's legal, however, and they no longer fear punishment, they will use it. So these are the people who are capable of being deterred by the threat of punishment. These are the people who are the focal point of the law. Right? The law hopes to deter criminality or cr crimes. And it does so by threatening people with punishment if they do this or fail to do that. So here's what Huzak says about this fear of arrest aspect. He says several factors suggest that the threat of punishment is not especially effective in curbing drug use. Now that may seem to go against your intuitions. It seems implausible that people would be uh, undeterred by the threat of punishment. But let's look at some evidence. Huzak marshals or puts together a range of different types of evidence to support his claim that fear of arrest does not suppress drug use. Number one, <clears throat> surveys. On page 26, Huzak writes, <clears throat> very few respondents to these surveys report that fear of arrest and prosecution led them to stop using drugs. In other words, many people who were asked point blank by surveyors said, I don't care what the law is, I'm going to use these drugs anyway. So fear of arrest was not deterring them. Fear of arrest was making no difference to their behavior. Now, surveys may not be reliable. We know that. But they're better than nothing. If all you had is a survey that may or may not be reliable and what I'll call conjecture or guessing, the survey is better than nothing. But just because it's better than nothing doesn't mean that we ought to put a lot of weight on it because we know that there are problems with survey methodologies. In fact, some of those problems were pointed out by Chief Justice William Rehnquist in the Atkins versus Virginia case that we looked at recently. Okay, that's the first point. What about consumption rates? Let me just read from Huzak, pages 26 and 27. Here's what he says. If the fear of punishment were a significant factor in deterring illicit or illegal drug use, one would expect that rates of consumption would decline as punishments increased in frequency and severity. 
You understand what he's saying? He's saying if the fear of punishment were a factor in drug use, then you would think, you would predict that as the punishments go up, use would go down. In other words, there would be an inver inverse correlation between the severity of the punishment and the degree of consumption or the overall amount of consumption. And Huzak says, quote, there is no correlation between the frequency and severity of punishment and trends in drug use. There is reliable evidence to show that. Okay? There's no inverse correlation between the severity of drug use, the severity of punishment and the degree of consumption or the amount uh, or quantity of consumption. All right, let's look at the next item. What is the experience of other countries on the question of drug use? Huzak says on page 27, most European countries have lower rates of illicit drug use than the United States. Of course, that's, that's the comparison class. Even though given drugs are often higher in quality, lower in price, and less likely to result in punishments. Unquote. Now that's, that's fascinating, isn't it? In European countries, most of them anyway, they, their drugs are higher in quality, they cost less, and they're less likely to result in punishments you would think that the use would be high in those countries. It's not. They have lower rates of illicit drug use than we do. So that goes against the claim being made by this slippery slope argument, that if we decriminalize drug use, the use will soar. Okay? More evidence that the first premise is false or at least unsupported. Next point, what about licit drug, drugs? You know what licit means now, legal. We've got legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco, and we've got illegal drugs like marijuana in states like Texas, heroin, LSD, and so on. Huzak points out that alcohol and tobacco use have decreased over time. Is that because people fear punishment? No, there is no punishment for alcohol use and tobacco use. So it's interesting that the use of legal drugs goes up and down independently of punishment or the degree of punishment. They're not punished. They're, that's why we're calling them legal or licit drugs. So we know that use fluctuates independently of punishment. What accounts for these trends, by the way? Why do drugs like alcohol and tobacco fluctuate in terms of their use? Huzak says, I don't know. He calls these trends, quote, baffling and mysterious. He, he says they're like fashion trends. Right? When I was your age, everyone wore bell-bottom jeans. There came, there came a time, in, I think in the 1980s, when bell-bottom jeans went out of style. It was shocking to people like me. I, I remember when Billy Idol, the musician, came on the scene in the early 80s. He wore straight-legged jeans and, they, and, and boots. And instead of bell bottoms that went all the way to the ground, covering up most of your shoe or boot, he wore jeans that came up above his boots. And I remember being shocked by this. It was, it really, it really discombobulated me for a while. I liked his music, but uh, he, he didn't look like the musicians I was used to. Long hair, bell bottoms, you know, groups like Led Zeppelin, or Black Sabbath, or, or, or Queen. <clears throat> Those are the groups I was used to, and they dressed pretty much alike. Now, to this day, I don't know why, those fa why the fashion changed. Maybe, maybe bell-bottoms have come back. You know the old saying, 
if you stay with your form of dress, it'll eventually come back in fashion. So people who kept wearing bell bottoms, maybe 10 or 15 years after they went out of fashion, they came back into fashion. So maybe drug use is like that. Who can account for fashion? Uh, who knows why hairstyles come and go, uh, clothing, uh, drug, drug use. Some drugs become fashionable, some become unfashionable. And that's what makes predictions treacherous, according to Huzak. We simply are unable to predict what will happen to drug use if we decriminalize it. Here's what he says on page 28 about that. He says, we have little reason to believe that punishments play a central role in explaining trends in drug use. So whether marijuana use goes up or down will probably be independent of whether it's punished by law. And the same with other drugs. So this argument, as, it, as appealing as it might be to some people, Huzak says, when you look closely at it, it falls apart. There's just not enough evidence to support the first premise of that slippery slope argument. Now, let's leave that argument aside and look at a couple of other incidental points that Huzak makes. Huzak, and I mentioned this the other day, Huzak is not against state action that is designed to discourage drug use. Educational campaigns, for example. Huzak says those are acceptable because education still leaves open the choice to use the substance. Whereas coercing people, that is threatening them with punishment, doesn't leave open the choice. It imposes a choice on people. It says, don't use this drug or else. It says you can either not use the drug and avoid punishment, that's this choice, or you can use the drug and face punishment. The law imposes that choice on everyone. Once again, you can use the drug and risk punishment for doing so, or you can abstain from using the drug and guarantee that you won't be punished. But someone might say, how dare you impose that choice on me? There's an obvious third choice that I would like to make. And that choice is using the drug and not risking punishment. So when the state coerces people by threatening them with punishment, the state is foreclosing an option. In that sense, it's depriving people of choice. It's saying you have this choice or this one, but not that third one in the middle. So Huzak is opposed to the state doing that. He's not opposed to the state doing other things. Let's read a little bit of what he says on page 28 of his article. Now I'm reading down here, it's the first column near the bottom. You can follow along if you'd like. If you don't have your copy in front of you, you can simply listen to me. The state, he says, may adopt any number of devices to discourage drug use, as long as these devices are not punitive, or he might have said coercive. Even more important, institutions other than the state can and do play a significant role in discouraging drug use. Now that's interesting, let's see what he says. After decriminalization, some of these institutions might exert even more influence. Private businesses, schools, insurance companies, and universities, to cite just a few examples, might adopt policies that discriminate against drug users. Suppose that employers fired or denied promotions to workers who use cocaine. 
suppose that schools barred students who drink alcohol from participating in extracurricular activities. Suppose that insurance companies charged higher premiums to policyholders who smoke tobacco. Suppose that colleges denied loans and grants to undergraduates who use marijuana. I do not, this is Huzak talking, I do not endorse any of these ideas. Many seem unwise and destined to backfire. Removing drug using kids from schools, for example, seems destined to increase their consumption. I simply point out that such institutions could have a far greater impact than our criminal justice system on people's decisions to use drugs. So don't misunderstand what Huzak is saying. He's not saying I necessarily support these private actions designed to discourage drug use. What he seems to be saying is that those are less oppressive than state coercion and punishment. And you would infer from that that if Huzak had to make a choice, either keep drugs illegal and punishable or decriminalize them and let private entities do these things to discourage drug use, you would think if those were the only two choices, he would go with this one, right? He doesn't like state coercion and punishment, all right? So keep in mind, he's not advocating those private actions. He's saying they would be better than what we currently have, which is prohibition and punishment. And one more interesting point, well, we have a couple more, but the next interesting point is, is it conceivable that keeping drugs illegal encourages use? Now, that, on its face, that seems crazy. Why would the illegality of it actually increase use? Well, there's an interesting phenomenon that's been studied. It's called the forbidden fruit phenomenon. The mere fact that something is illegal seems to attract certain people and make them more likely to do it. Some people like breaking the law. It makes them feel rebellious. It makes them feel, well, it's risk-taking. Right? We know people. some people are drawn to risk. There are people who like jumping out of planes. You could die. They know that. They do it anyway. And I assume that Part of the desire to do that is the thrill that you get from risking your life, right? It's, you might call it a rush. It's a combination of exhilaration and terror. It's called a rush. Wow. Imagine two people who lumped, jumped out of a plane. They both made it to the ground safely and now they're talking. One says to the other, wow, what a rush. And the other one says, you got that right. They enjoyed it. Yes, it was risky, but that was part of the thrill. Well, it's not so hard to imagine someone, especially a young person, saying or thinking, I know it's illegal to smoke pot, but I'm going to do it anyway. Not just because I like the experience, but partly because I know it's illegal and I want to see whether I can get away with it. There's also this notion of um, outwitting the authorities, right? Doing things secretively, uh, out, of the v out of view of police officers and parents and other teachers and other people who might turn you in. That's part of the thrill. So we should take seriously this notion of forbidden fruit. So here's what Huzak seems to be saying. If we decriminalize drugs, the people who were using them because it was a thrill will no longer have that reason to use them. They may have other reasons. They may still enjoy the experience of 
using those drugs, but the thrill of being a lawbreaker or a scoff, scoff law or an outlaw is gone. The thrill is gone. In, in fact, I wonder, in states like Colorado, which have now decriminalized marijuana use, has marijuana use become boring? Is it just like smoking cigarettes now? I mean, at one time you had communities of potheads. I saw this when I was a high school and college student. The potheads hung together. Uh, they knew where to get marijuana. Uh, some of them sold it to others. They had routines by which they got together uh, to sell the drug or purchase the drug. It was a little community. Well, once you decriminalize marijuana use, there's no need to be secretive anymore. You go down to the next to the pot shop and you buy an ounce of marijuana. It's like buying a pack of Camels or Winston cigarettes. Boring, right? The thrill is gone. Marijuana has become normalized like uh, cigarettes. And some people might, may no longer even have a desire to use it. Boy, it sure was fun back when uh, it was us against the world. Uh, now it's, it's like uh, going down to buy some groceries. All right. Um, Huzak points out that new drugs may be invented that will be substituted for more harmful drugs, such as tobacco and alcohol. Now, I think Huzak put this in there to tweak certain of his readers. He says on page 29, alcohol is the drug implicated in most of the date rapes, property damage, and violent behavior on campus, unquote. And those are legal. Alcohol, I'm sorry, that is, that is legal. It's legal to consume alcohol, provided you are of age. And yet alcohol use is implicated in a great many crimes. Uh, it, it, it generates a great deal of harm to others, including the harms caused by drunk driving, as you know. We've discussed that at length. So Huzak thinks that drugs like marijuana probably are less harmful to others than drugs that are already legal, such as alcohol. So that's an additional reason to decriminalize them. Now, it, it's simple fairness. If alcohol is legal, why should marijuana be illegal? I mean, you may want to write to your Texas legislators if you're persuaded by this and say, look, you represent me in the Texas legislature and you should care about my views since you represent me. My view is that for various reasons, marijuana should be decriminalized. One of those reasons is that alcohol already is decriminalized. In fact, alcohol, if it was never criminalized, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right to call it decriminalized. It's simply a legal substance, not subject to punishment. Um, so you could write to your elected representative and say, um, I would like you to decriminalize marijuana for this and other reasons. There's an inconsistency in the law. Why are some drugs criminalized and others not when their effects are either the same or even where those that are legal are more harmful than those that are not legal, like marijuana. Okay, let's end our discussion of this article and our lecture for today by reading what Huzak says at the end of his article, because it's very interesting. I'm looking now at page 29, and I'm going to read with you, I'm going to read two paragraphs, the final two paragraphs. One of them involves an analogy to pizza, which I'm sure is one of your favorite things, as it is mine. Huzak says, for all of these reasons, we should avoid predictions 
about how the decriminalization of drugs will affect rates of consumption. An even more important point is that these empirical conjectures or guesses are not especially relevant to the topic at hand. We are looking for a respectable reason to criminalize drug use. Predictions about how decriminalization will cause an increase in drug use simply do not provide such a reason. Indeed, this reason could be given against repealing virtually any law, however unjustified it may be. Let me illustrate this point by providing an example of an imaginary crime that I assume everyone would agree to be unjustified. Suppose that the state, Texas for example, suppose that the state sought to curb obesity by prohibiting people from eating pizza, an offense that would pass the rational basis test, by the way. Now that's Huzak the lawyer speaking. If the state of Texas prohibited and punished the consumption of pizza on the ground that it contributes to obesity, which is a public health hazard, if someone challenged that law and claimed that it was unconstitutional, the law would be upheld in all likelihood because there's no fundamental right to eat pizza in the Constitution of the state of Texas or in the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, the test that would be employed by the court would be the rational basis test. And as I told you the other day, when you use that test, almost always the law gets upheld. The law will be upheld if there's any rational connection between the law and a legitimate state purpose. And clearly there is here, right? There's a legit, there's a rational connection between eating certain foods like pizza and gaining weight and obesity is well within the state's police power. The, the police power means not police officers. It means the state's inherent authority to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the people. And obesity undermines the health of the people. So Huzak is saying that the, a law prohibiting pizza would be upheld. Now, thank goodness the state of Texas has not enacted such a law. A lot of people would be very upset, but the law would stand. I think a lot of legislators would be vote, voted out of office. And that's what the court would say. The court would say, look, if you don't like this law, don't blame us for upholding it. Blame the legislators who enacted the law. And if you wish, throw them out of office and put new people in there who will then repeal the law against pizza. Okay, let's continue. Suppose that a group of philosophers convened to discuss whether we should change this law. Remember, the law got passed and it was upheld, we'll say. A group of philosophers convened to discuss whether we should change this law and decriminalize pizza consumption or pizza use. Someone would be likely to protest that repealing this law would cause the consumption of pizza to increase. Imagine someone saying this in the, among the philosophers. Whoa, wait a minute. You're advocating decriminalizing pizza consumption? But wait, if we do that, the consumption of pizza will soar. If people are no longer worried about being prosecuted and punished for eating pizza, they will buy more of it, more fat, more obesity, more of a public health problem, a disaster in the making. Huzak says, I imagine they would be correct. But surely this prediction would not serve to justify retaining this imaginary prohibition. If we lacked a good reason to attack the problem of obesity by punishing pizza eaters in the first place, the effects of repeal and pizza consumption would not provide such a reason. And so with drugs, unless we already have a reason to punish pizza consumption, 
the prediction does not provide a good reason to continue to punish it. So Huzak think that, thinks that this prediction-based argument has things backward. We shouldn't take it for granted that the prohibition on drug use is legitimate and then worry that if we decriminalize it, it the use will soar. We need to go back way before that and ask, was there ever a legitimate reason to criminalize this, the use of this drug or this pizza? And the answer, he thinks, is no. At least that's the question we should be asking. Is there a good reason to criminalize drug use? Yes or no? Only if we answer that question yes, should we ask, should we look at the prediction argument? Right? Once, once a particular drug is criminalized and been on the books, the, the law been on the books for a while, suppose someone then suggests decriminalizing it we then would look at what would happen if we did so. And if drug use would soar, if we had good reason to think it would soar, that, that might be a good reason not to decriminalize. But the, the main question is, was there ever good reason to criminalize the drug in the first place? And of course, Huzak's view is, no, there wasn't, no, there isn't. So that's a nice analogy, isn't it? That's the kind of thing a philosopher brings to a topic. Remember, Huzak is a trained attorney, and I'm sure he's practiced law, but he's also a philosopher. And you can see when you read this article, it's, it's informed about the law and how the law works, but he's also a very good philosopher. He's looking at arguments for and against things like decriminalization. Philosophers are able to come up with counterexamples, like the pizza example. Now, I'm not saying a lawyer couldn't have come up with that, but I think a philosopher is more likely to. That's how we're trained to think when we've been trained in philosophy. Okay, one more paragraph and we'll be done. This is, you could think of this as the grand conclusion of the article. Huzak says this, <clears throat> if there is a good reason to criminalize illicit drug use, we have yet to find it. We need a better reason to criminalize something other than predictions about how its frequency would increase if punishments were not imposed. These predictions are dubious, both normatively and, in this case, empirically. Despite my uncertainty about the future, there is one prediction about which we can be absolutely confident. After decriminalization, those who use illicit drugs will not face arrest and prosecution. The lives of drug users will not, would not be devastated by a state that is committed to waging war against them. Punishment, we must always be reminded, is the worst thing a state can do to us. The worst, not among the worst things, the worst thing. The single prediction we can safely make about decriminalization is that it will improve the lives of the hundreds of thousands of people who otherwise would be punished for the crime of using drugs for recreational purposes. Once again, now I'm not advocating anything. I'm not expressing my view at all about whether marijuana use should or should not be criminal and punishable. I have my views, I have not expressed them, and you should not try to infer my views from anything I've said. When I'm teaching, I'm educating, I'm not indoctrinating. So my views are irrelevant. What I will say is this, you are a citizen of the state of Texas and of the United States. You as a citizen have every right to make your views known. You can and perhaps should contact your elected representatives, 
you have a senator and a member of the Texas House of Representatives, both of whom represent you as well as others in your district. Again, you have every right to contact them and, and express your views. If you believe that the law that prohibits possession of marijuana, and presumably therefore the use, because you can't use marijuana unless you're in possession of it. So this law that prohibits and punishes possession, EO ipso, prohibits and punishes use. So if you believe that this law is justifiable, you may want to contact your elected representatives and let them know. You may say, I don't know whether you're considering repealing the law, but I want you to know that I want that law. I like that law. I think it's justifiable. So please don't repeal it or amend it. On the other hand, if you have a strong view, I guess I can put this down now, right? If you have a strong view that this law is unjust, that there's no good reason for it, that it infringes individual liberty, you, you can and should, perhaps should, contact your elected representatives and make your views known to them. Tell them, I believe this law is unjust. I believe that it should be repealed. And if you won't repeal it, I will vote for someone who will. You have every right to make that known. Now, should you fear recrimination? Uh, I don't know. That's up to you. It's at least conceivable that if you contact your elected representatives and tell them you want the marijuana law repealed, they might notify local authorities to watch you. They may assume that you are a user of marijuana and that you have an unprincipled reason for retaining or for repealing this law. But I don't think you should worry about that. While it's conceivable, it's barely that. Uh, there's real, realistically no chance you will be uh, surveilled uh, if you make your views known. So exercise your rights as a citizen, either in support of laws like this or in opposition. Okay, that's it. Now, there were some replies to this article, which you can track down if you wish but I covered only the article by Huzak, and that's the only one you will be tested on. If you're looking at my lecture notes, you'll see that I have some notes on the essay by George Scher, S-H-E-R. Um, I've taught it in the past. Uh, I, I chose not to this time. I thought that three days on Huzak would be enough, and we did spend three full periods on it. Okay, that's it. Um, not that it matters to you, but I think this will be the last recorded lecture I ever give. Um, I have one more year before I retire, and I'm assuming that COVID will be a thing of the past by the time fall rolls around. Maybe it won't be. Maybe we'll be back online. Who knows? But I expect that there will be nothing but in-person lectures in the next academic year. So I have no reason to ever ever to record a lecture again. Uh, it has its advantages and its disadvantages. Uh, it's a little bit bittersweet, therefore, uh, knowing that I won't be doing this again. But that's the way it is. Okay, I'll send you an email just before the exam, probably the day before, to remind you. But good luck in your studying, and maybe I'll see some of you in the fall, uh, in the fall semester. Take care.